Well, Peter, thanks for joining us today. Certainly a pleasure. Wonderful. Thanks. We have a couple of other panelists and I'm, I'm pleased to introduce them and then I get to stop talking and we start the, the more exciting part of the program. We're joined today to, by two researchers who are currently fellows at the East-West Center Humane Artificial Intelligence Initiative. Really excited to be able to introduce them both in turn. First, uh, Dr. Andre Uhl is a human, uh, sorry, humane, he is a human, but he's also a humane AI fellow here at the East-West Center. His research explores the role of place-based knowledge for the responsible governance of emerging technologies, particularly with regard to deploying AI in community-based climate action. We're also joined by Dr. Emily Perry, who is the founder of Rootbridge Ecosystems and a co-collaborator and a researcher across networks of local endogenous and indigenous peoples engaged around the climate crisis and ecological regeneration. Really, really excited to have all three of you here today to speak from your various um, areas of interest and expertise about humane artificial intelligence and really what it is that people should know about that, particularly people who are um, in the role of leadership and action in their various communities across the world. So again, thank you both um, or all, Peter, Emily, and Andre for joining us. And Peter, I get to turn it over to you now and ask you to, um, to sort of start us off. Tell us a little about um, what brought you to write the book and why this is an important issue for us to be discussing today. Thank you, Gretchen, for the kind introduction and the opportunity to, to be present here for this, uh, this global audience. Uh, the book actually emerged out of a longstanding interest that I've had in technology and how it affects society. I did a book maybe 20 years ago um, and wanted to follow that up to see whether the kind of prognostications that I'd done in that book actually came true. And it, it turned out that a, a lot of things were sort of on track. And what I'd like to do in the next uh, maybe 10 minutes is sort of characterize what I see as the major trends that are emerging around artificial intelligence or what I refer to as intelligent technology and both why we should be excited about that and why we should be concerned about that. So all of us are probably aware that we're in the midst of this proliferation of artificial or, or I think what are really more accurately called synthetic intelligences. that's triggering what's being heralded as the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, I would rather call it a the intelligence revolution because it's a revolution that's as metaphysical as it is industrial and it's as social as it is informational. If you're a techno optimist engaging intelligent technology kind of at the, the technical and commercial frontiers, then the excitement is just so great and it's really warranted. Uh, intelligent technology has unprecedented promise for solving previously insoluble business, public administration, engineering and research problems. That's the kind of stuff you hear on, on radio, on the media, on TV all the time about where AI is taking us. Uh, but no technology is risk-free and the perils of AI are just as unprecedented as its promises are. If you go to the opposite end of the spectrum, you talk to the techno-pessimists, well, they're looking to the far scientific horizons and they're worried about the existential threat to humanity of what has been referred to as a technological singularity. The advent of super intelligent artificial agents that are acting in their own interest, not in human interests. And I think those concerns are, are prudent um, and that promoting the uh, synchronization of artificial or synthetic intelligences with human values is I think absolutely important. It's become one of the precautionary cornerstones of all the AI ethics guidelines and principles that have been proliferating over the last 10 years or so. But I think that really what should concern us profoundly and much more immediately is the alignment of artificial intelligence with current human values. And to illustrate why that's the, the case, and I think this is consonant with a lot of what the East West Center is doing is look at what's happening with climate change. So the technologies of the second and third industrial revolutions scaled up human intentions for about 200 years before it became evident that continued industrial scale burning of fossil fuels was going to change the planetary system of climate. Humanity's known about that now for about 50 years. And the fact that over a half a century, humanity has failed to generate the kind of commitment globally that's necessary either to stop the climate change from happening 
or at least to ameliorate the worst of its impacts, that's a real issue for us because it's not a matter of scientific or technical lack of knowledge or lack of uh, uh, wherewithal. We've got the scientific and technical ability to address climate change. The reason why climate change is continuing and the, the effects are going to continue ramping up is because we have a conflict of values, a conflict among economic, social, cultural, political values. So climate change is not a technical problem, it's an ethical predicament. And similarly, the intelligence revolution is forcing our confrontation with a nexus of conflicting human values that has to be resolved ethically before any technical responses are gonna be viable. And unfortunately, we're not gonna have a couple of centuries to get our act together as humanity. We're gonna have a couple of decades probably. And what I would see us heading toward is not a technological singularity, it's an ethical singularity. Ethics can be minimally defined, I think, as the art of human course correction. And it's the art of discriminating qualitatively among our aims, our interests, our values, and our means for realizing them, and then changing our conduct in order to reduce the sum total of, let's say, conflict, trouble, and suffering that we're engaged. That ethical singularity that we're being pressed toward by intelligent technology is an historical choke point at which the opportunity space for future further human course correction collapses. It's an arrival at a point beyond which we're gonna have no more chance of escaping the effects of human values conflicts than light has of escaping a cosmological black hole. And I understand why the, the near-term risks of an ethical singularity has received a lot less attention than the longer-term risks of artificial superintelligence. I think it's useful to draw a distinction between tools and technologies. Tools are things. There are localizable artifacts that have been designed and manufactured to augment or extend human capacities for carrying out certain kinds of activities. And they can be evaluated in terms of how well they do the jobs that they've been designed to do. With tools, we can always exercise exit rights. We can choose not to use them. Technologies are relational systems. They're non-localizable patterns of material and conceptual practices that embody and deploy both strategic and normative values. They qualitatively transform the ways we relate to the world and with one another. And in actuality, we do not build or use technologies. We participate in them. Technologies emerge from and structure our conduct as humans much as natural ecosystems emerge from and then dynamically inform or structure species relationships. And by scaling up and structuring human values and intentions, technologies shape both human emotions and human motivations, altering both how and why we do the things that we do. And thus technologies can't be evaluated in terms of task specific utilities. Technologies can only be evaluated ethically in terms of how they mediate and qualitatively affect human-human and human-world relational dynamics. Now, what sets intelligent technology apart from all previous technologies is that intelligent technology is not a passive conductor of human intentions and values. It is an active and innovative amplifier and accelerator of our intentions and values. It's thus capable of scaling up the tool risks of accidents of design and misuse by design. That's something that goes along with all tools that are produced technologically, but also of multiplying those tool risks by the structural and relational risks that arise when technologies emerge in alignment with uncoordinated or conflicting values. In my analysis of what's going on with the change dynamics around intelligent technology, a really crucial point is that we're undergoing a transition from what I call the attention economy 1.0, when mass advertising was used to attract and harvest attention and convert it into revenue by stimulating demand for mass produced goods and services. And transiting from that to the economy, attention economy 2.0, that began emerging along with digital network infrastructure that enabled 24 seven connectivity an infrastructure through which the users of digital search, uh, social media, e-commerce are being drafted into doing double duty as consumers of individually targeted material and informational goods and services, but also as producers of the training data for the smart systems, the algorithmic systems 
that are laboring tirelessly and creatively to accelerate and expand the revenue generating processes of attention capture and exploitation. So in sum, instead of having crude price signals to deal with, uh, commercial interests now have multi-layered, highly granular data about consumer desires, behaviors, fears, to realize unprecedented gains in both predictive certainty and behavioral control. And to get a sense of just how much data is being generated, it's estimated that by 2025, just four years from now, humanity will be generating the equivalent of 10 hours of high definition video for every person on the planet every day. And it's this ubiquitous attention carried data radiance that is fueling a Cambrian explosion, an evolutionary explosion of synthetic intelligences and smart services that are transforming pretty much every dimension of society. And this is not just a commercial revolution, it's a geopolitical revolution. Uh, Vladimir Putin and the Chinese government both in 2018 announced that whoever leads in AI globally uh, will lead the world globally. And the United States has recently come up with a similar sort of statement in a recent uh, AI and security statement, a huge document that was put out, uh, started in the Trump campaign, but just recently uh, released. It basically makes the argument that if America does not get on board with ramping up its development and deployment of artificial intelligence, we're gonna fall behind geopolitically. It's a national security imperative. So something like a new great game is underway. Those of you who know a little bit of history know that at the end of the 19th, early 20th century, a great game among colonial and imperial powers was being played for land grabs, labor grabs, basically looking for resources. The new great game is not a land grab, it's a time grab. It's a global competition for total time and attention share and control of the dynamics of consciousness itself, a process I refer to as the colonization of consciousness. And it's tempting to see this as a competition between something like an American or European a choice valuing West and a control valuing China or East. But that framing doesn't do justice to either the geopolitical or the ethical complexity that we're facing. The AI arms race, if you want to call it that, is not about winning battles. It's about winning hearts and minds, transmuting human sentience and agency from the inside out. And I think that for some people, it seems like, well, what's the big deal? I mean, we're getting an ability to achieve, to experience pretty much what we want, when we want it on demand. It's social connection, it's digital and physical goods, it's streaming music and film and so on and so forth. The amount of stuff that's available through the web is just astonishing and we get it all free of charge for nothing more than our data exhaust. It's corporate and state rights to make use of our data to train these systems. That seems almost like a technological dream come true, but I think we have really good reason to believe that it's not. You could look at works that have been done by researchers like Shosana Zuboff on surveillance capitalism or by Eric Brinjolfson and Andrew McAfee about the network economy and it's become evident now that network economics are prone to monopolistic, fantastic concentrations of wealth and power. That's a bad thing. Global inequality is huge. In 2018, the eight richest people in the world had more wealth than the poorest three and a half billion people. A stunning number. But egregious wealth and power inequalities aren't anything new. What is new is the wealth generation and power generation is being done through the recursive algorithmic use of our own intelligence that's encoded in our patterns of attention that's captured by these algorithms and then used to feed back, feed forward to us a set of uh, opportunities for digital download, for experience, for search, for recommendations and so on that then command our further attention. It's this recursive loop of attention, our attention being used to command more of our attention. It's a scaling up of a logic of domination, not through acts of coercion, but rather through ambiently reinforced choice and craving. What we're at risk of trading off is our most basic freedom, freedom of attention. Attention is the one resource that we need to make a difference in our lives or in the lives of anybody else. 
Without freedom of attention, we don't have freedom of intention. Without freedom of intention, the ethical dimension of the human mind and intelligence collapses. Creative course correction becomes impossible. So that's the worry. That's what I think we're facing. And what's the response? Well, I think it's a number of things. We need a new system of ethics. And it's ethics beyond an individual, cultural, or national standpoint. We need to develop a global ethical ecosystem to be able to chat, to respond to and resolve the global predicament of intelligent technology. That means we're going to have to be present in such a way to engage with ethical virtuosity. And that's a practice. Like musical virtuosity, which is the reward of devoted musical uh, practice, ethical virtuosity is the fruit of sustained practice in the art of human course correction. We need to work at that. And that practice, that learning takes time. And to gain the time that we need for the educational reforms of the kind and extent that I think are needed for us to develop both the capacities for and the commitments to openly creative predicament resolution and to halt the permeation or at least forestall some of the permeation of our social, economic, political, and cultural lives by intelligent technology, we're gonna to have to do something in terms of both data governance and in terms of education. Some people have talked about the possibility of digital asceticism. You just sort of buy out of the system. Some people talk about digital hedonism. Let's just go full bore into it because it's actually, there's nothing wrong with what can I as an individual do about it anyway? And I think neither of those are apt responses. What we need is collective digital activism. As a tactical response, something like connectivity strikes, not you know, data fasting, but connectivity strikes, something that we could talk about later if there's uh, interest in that, but also to kind of a longer term strategic response, looking at the data sphere as something that we can govern as a public good and resource commons, maybe making use of some of what we've learned about both the possibilities of a carbon cap and trade and a carbon tax uh, sort of regime as a governance system to try to forestall climate change, and take an idea from that and say, maybe we could have something like a data attention cap and trade or tax scheme. And we can talk about that in some detail again later on. But we also need an educational reform. And that is education that is geared toward predicament resolving skill, toward creativity, open creativity, not just innovation, which is being able to arrive at goals that you've already know by new means. Improvisation is open-ended, it's open creativity in which what we're doing is to try to figure out how to expand the horizons of what we consider both acceptable, uh, achievable and in terms of what's desirable. So the singularity ahead is really not about whether we continue to be human. It's about whether or not we prove able to demonstrate the shared resolve that's needed to change the evolutionary arc of this new Cambrian explosion, demonstrating both clarity about and commitment to becoming ever more virtuosically humane. Thank you. Peter, thank you very much for um, an in a very inspiring, um, thought-provoking introduction to, certainly to your book, but more importantly to your work and the questions that you, um, you're looking at and, and asking others and particularly working on with um, folks like Andre and Emily. And Andre and Emily, I would like to invite you both now to um, maybe to respond to um, some of what Peter has just shared with all of us. Um, but you also have uh, curated some questions for Peter. And so this is a chance for you to share those questions with him and with one another. And we can have a kind of dialogue, or as we, we say here, a talk story um, to help us tease out some of um, what Peter's just shared with us and the questions that you both are bringing to the table on this issue. So Andre, we start with you, I suppose. Yes, yeah, thank you, Gretchen, uh, for the invitation to be part of this panel. Thank you, Peter, for this very instructive uh, introduction to the topic. Uh, I would actually like to go, uh, you know, a bit deeper into what you refer as the ethical singularity versus ethical virtuosity, right? In my own research, I look at the rise of so-called hyperfutures that are massively ambitious tech projects that require equally massive governance measures. You already, you know, talked a bit about this right now, but um, 
I do think that the AI ethics dilemma especially describes a highly industrialized society stuck in a systemic cause and effect relationship of what Ulrich Beck, for example, would call manufactured risks that are, you know, the pro proliferation of hazards involving a high level of human agency in both their production as well as mitigation. So the onset of AI could be considered a manufactured risk because it has really reoriented our collective cultural attention around the risk management of an increasingly inhumane future, so to say. Um, in the space of AI ethics, we see a proliferation of guidelines and standards in recent years um, offered by think tanks, multi-stakeholder groups, governments, corporations, and so on and so forth, that often uh, orient themselves around human rights frameworks. Principles such as fairness, accountability, transparency have become buzzwords in the AI ethics space. And most recently also, we see the push for more ethical diversity in the discourse and um, the quest for, so to say, decolonizing AI. So in these frameworks, uh, we use AI um, in a way that it will be likely continue to be analyzed, critiqued and defended in between an increasing variety of ethical arguments that offer different realization and combinations of we could say humanist or transhumanist or post-humanist and possibly at unknown positions, right? But instead of opening the possibility of diverse and epistemically just futures, um, we're just increasing also the sophistication of the AI ethics discourse and therefore also contribute to a snowball effect where more governance frameworks will also cause more relevance for a future with AI. So I am wondering here, in our AI ethics and governance community in particular, are we actually asking the right questions? So while many voices are concerned about who gets a seat at the table in deciding what kind of ethical use we should make of AI, shouldn't we rather push a bit further and ask whose table are we requesting to be seated at? And that's, I think, refers very nicely also to, uh, Peter, what you have called the collective digital activism. So I wonder, since we are also talking today about your book that is also addressing the Buddhist framework in this conversation, if the Buddhist framework can offer a way out of this dilemma, and uh, if so, how? Well, that's a great deal to try to digest and respond to. Thank you, Andre. Um, I think that one of the things that uh, I could say about this, the development of AI ethics guidelines and principles so far today, is that while they concentrate on um, insisting that we develop AI that's consistent with human values, there's not a clear specification of which values or exactly how those values are to be understood. So if you take something like privacy, that'll be one of the uh, concerns of this upcoming symposium uh, that we're hosting here at the, online via the East West Center uh, in about a week and a half. Privacy is really differently understood in different cultural contexts. I mean, if you were raised in a traditional Chinese family, the way my wife was, then there's no such thing as privacy, certainly not at the home. And that the privacy line is not drawn in anything like the way that line is drawn in the West. So there's huge cultural disagreement about a basic concept or value like privacy that I think has not been taken into account. Then there's the other problem of it being human aligned. And that's another uh, common principle, a cornerstone is, AI that's aligned with human interest. And well, what are our human interests? I can go back a few generations and say, well, we had people like Adolf Hitler. He had interests and he was a human. And Nazism is a human construct and it was based on a certain set of values. Are those values that we would want to align AI with? I don't think so. Similarly, we can ask, can you align AI to be disruptive? to serve the purpose of disinformation, to, do the per to serve the purpose of producing deep fakes that either produce confusion or persuade populations to, for example, vote in certain kinds of ways. I think that's a very dangerous route to go down. So simply saying that we're going to align AI with human values or align it with human interests, the question you asked was, whose interests? It's who's at the table and who are these being designed for? And I think one of the things that you're bringing to our initiative at the East West Center that's just so great is this sensitivity to indigenous knowledge 
indigenous interests. What do minorities around the world, what do indigenous peoples around the world both want from and can they benefit from rolling out intelligent technology? So the technology itself is I think not value neutral, but the, the issue is what kinds of powers does it give us both in terms of knowing powers, epistemic powers, and the, the powers to change things in the world, ontological powers, including human consciousness. And in what directions do we want to change those? I think what Buddhism brings to the table is a set of principles about who we want to be present as in order to be able to address these kinds of values conflicts, because we're always immersed in them. We human beings are not simple in the sense that we, we align even with our own selves. And we often act in ways that we end up falling into trouble, we make big mistakes, we have to correct for it. That's part of human nature is to learn from our mistakes. And I think what Buddhism offers is a set of resources for both understanding that process, how we engage in that personally, but I think most importantly, an emphasis on quality of attention and quality of consciousness. Because if we're really operating in this attention economy 2.0, one of the things that is crucially important if we're going to regain any kind of critical leverage against this system is to be able to know when our attention is being manipulated, to be able to when to know when our quality of consciousness is being degraded, how that's happening, and to resist that. So I describe the Buddhist middle path as one of, whether it's respect to our own personal development or it's with respect to philosophical issues or these technological ones, there's always a range of opinions, there's a range of views. And I think that what we wanna do is start with recognition. The recognition that you know, China is 100% correct about what it's doing with AI 10% of the time. The United States is totally correct about what it's doing in terms of the commercial rollout and military application of AI about 10% of the time. Nobody's 100% right 100% of the time. But you can recognize the value in what these different systems are bringing, ethical systems, political systems. And then to ask the question, okay, given that, we wanna resist their universalization. I think there would be nothing worse than to scale up the Chinese approach to AI globally. I think also there's nothing worse than scaling up the American approach or the European approach or the Israeli approach or the, the Iranian approach. What we don't wanna have is a single system prevailing everywhere. What we want is a diverse, diversity enhancing, intelligent technology ecosystem within which the different uh, ethical and the different cultural values of peoples are brought into productive accord with one another. And that's a work that's gonna be generational in nature. It's not something that's gonna be accomplished in a month or two or by writing an ethics guideline. Nice. Um, thank you both, Andre, for your, your questions and sharing some of your insights into this and, and Peter for, as always, your um, illustrative responses that help um, those of us who aren't as well versed in these issues really get a sense of what's key here. Um, Emily, you also have some questions. Um, I would like to give you an opportunity to ask questions of both your panelists, particularly Peter, but both panelists. Um, and then after that, maybe any responses from all of you on what we've discussed so far. And then we have a few questions from um, the audience that I'd like to share. So Emily, over to you. Thank you so much, Gretchen. And thanks to Peter and to Andre. Um, this is a great opportunity to delve into a book that illustrates um, how deeply we need at this point um, creative, deep, critical thinking. Um, and, and so I would like to draw out, suss out an element um, with which you framed um, your, your book, Peter, talking about how we many do believe that we are on the cusp or already within a fourth industrial revolution as the intelligence revolution. And as that functions at this point in time, it is the industrial pro-society on steroids in a way. It's an accelerated digital hedonism um, that enables um, mass consumption, mass production, and um, accelerated planned obsolescence. Um, 
And at this uh, period of time, there are similar patterns of a projection of a revolution emerging at this time that takes on very different qualities and in many ways emerges from Buddhist thought and earth systems thought, but is also formed in critique of the industrial growth society. Um, some of those revolutions, um, Zanella or Dana Meadows proposed at the turn of the century that we were entering into the sustainable revolution. Um, Joanna Macy coined the great turning. David Corton talked about a new systems economics as the great transformation. And Roy Rappaport also looked at this turn of the century as a time of awakening and a shift in values, a shift in systems, a shift in governance that would be more inclusive, that could transcend the colonial structures of our industrial growth societies, and that could posit a, a frame of values that was um, honoring the rights and well-being of all cultures, all peoples, and ecosystems, so human and non-humans alike. And much of that came from the interconnectivity inter and the relational values and the relational identity that emerges through Buddhism. Um, Joanna Macy herself and general systems theorists um, were informed by Buddhism and an understanding of humans governance systems being and economies being part of a mutual dynamic co-arising within our ecosystems and our earth system. If we look at these theorists and these practical actions that are projecting some very divergent revolutions and changes. One is in, in this intelligence revolution as it stands now is this intensification of everything that has already been contributing to the root causes of climate change, of ecological crises, of aggravated um, distances between wealth and poverty, of great vulnerability and complexity of forced migration around the planet. And now we are moving into a period where we're accelerating those behaviors and we're seeing greater chasms between those who are safe and those who are vulnerable. While these other systems that are emerging are saying we can transcend and overcome that. Of course, um, as Johan Rockström has very, um, very beautifully illustrated, uh, we would need at least seven planets, planet Earths to live in that way at an advancing rate. Um, and currently, if we are to live within our planetary boundaries, we cannot be continuing to expand in the industrial hyperconsumptive manner. Within the equity thread of discourse, there's a tendency to still look within the narrow frames of the industrial market system, the dominant paradigm. And so um, if Haitians want to be not left out of the picture, but be brought into the picture, they are going to have Creole digital courses and they become part of that digital economy without the critical engagement on what that impact will have on them, their safety, their well-being, their rights, um, and their consciousness. Um, and will this be a neo-neo-colonialization of consciousness and um, states of being? but also what impact that will have on their outside of their virtual reality, but in their material reality and their spiritual reality. So a question that I'd like to, to hear you explore a bit more because I realize this is quite a big question, but as you're looking in, especially in chapter eight and nine, when you're looking at course correction and course correction within governance, course correction within education, um, and within the time frame that we have of a couple of decades for course correction, where are the potential applied spaces for bridging these visions of an ecocene, out of an Anthropocene into an ecocene of a sustainable revolution um, that can walk a middle path with the reality of our, our artificial intelligence um, world? And is that possible? Can the earth sustain it? Can cli will climate change be the shock that <laughs> forces the stop, the stoppage? Or is there a possibility for us to do 
something to have as forced stoppage prior to external shocks. Well, clearly a huge question. And I mean, like you, Emily, and I think probably, I'm assuming a lot of the people who are in the audience who would show up for something like this. I mean, I think that we all hope for uh, that turn away from this industrialization that's control oriented toward a, a kind of a human technology world relationship in which contribution matters more than control or choice. In which contribution, I mean, it's, it requires two things. And I harp on this a lot with the, this concept of diversity. The diversity is not just a function of people having different identities and differing from each other. Diversity, as I understand it, is a relational achievement when differences become the basis of mutual contribution to sustainably shared flourishing. And that requires us not just to differ from each other, it requires us to proactively, insightfully, and imaginatively differ for one another. So I need to figure out how to differ in ways that are appreciated, that is both sympathetically connected with, but also in a way that add value to what I'm doing and what I'm contributing by others. And that requires us to work across these cultural, these national and generational boundaries. So I think that the key is to try to get these kinds of intercultural, intergenerational, international, interdisciplinary, diversity enhancing collaborations underway. But we can't do that if we enter into those, the negotiations that are necessarily gonna be part of that on the basis of, I've got my, my bottom line. I'm not willing to give up X, Y, or Z. I'm not willing to do this. And these are my achievables that I'm looking for. And it's, it's like the business negotiation style. And I think we need a huge change. And I would refer to it somewhat humorously, uh, but not entirely facetiously as a sift from a kind of logic of negotiation where we have bottom lines to a logic of flirtation where you meet somebody and you don't know where it's going to go. You're sharing things, you're putting things out for them to, to engage with. And if, if they pull on something and say, hey, I'm really interested in that, then you, you do more of that. And if we take that dynamic as being the basis of moving forward, then I think we have hope to go in the direction you're talking about. But if we continue to have this sort of instrumental attitude of we've got to have either a win-loss mentality or a win-win mentality where only one or a few players get to decide what winning means, then we're not going to go to the future that you and Macy and people like that would want to envision. And it's going to require us being really differently present as both consumers and citizens, as family members. And yes, Buddhism has a lot to offer. I think Christianity has a lot. Islam has a lot. Indigenous traditions have a lot. All of these traditions would not have persisted if they did not offer real resources for people dealing with predicaments of the kind that we face all the time in life. These values conflicts in families, in neighborhoods, in communities. So the technologies that are now being used at industrial scale, you could look at something like the gig economy. Uh, I've got a 19 year old son who's really supercharged about doing you know, Uber Eats because he can deliver and make 25, 30 bucks an hour most days because people are tipping and this and that and the other. And I'm like, do you understand that by you doing this, you're participating in this larger system in which if people had neighbors and they had needs for others to go out and get food for them, there are people who legitimately need food delivered to them. Their neighbors aren't doing that. They do Uber Eats instead. What would it take for us to have, not an Uber Eats where it's a commercial organization, but an Uber Eats that's a community organization to facilitate people being able to do for one another the kinds of things that Ivan Illich was envisioning in his uh, 1970s work on tools for conviviality. How do we get into a true sharing economy, not a gig economy, but a real sharing economy in which my talents, your talents, Andre's talents, Gretchen's talents, and the talents of everybody in this audience can somehow be merged together in a way where the sum of it is greater than the, the individual, you know, where the whole becomes greater than the sum. That's what we're looking for. And I think the technology can help us with that. I think the data analytics that's involved in it can help us with that. But we need people at the engineering level who are being informed by the values that are consistent with that, not the control prediction 
uh, production of behavior sort of values that are now being built into these systems. So I, I, it's, it's not a concise response, but I think that you're right, that these are the possibilities. And what we need is an entirely different kind of intelligent technology than the one that's being deployed now. Emily, Peter, Andre, thank you, um, particularly. Um, Peter for your robust answers and Andre and Emily for your great questions. Um, we, have, we have a particularly active um, participant in the audience who's posed some questions that I'd really like to get to. But before I do, I just wonder if there's anything that I, that the three of you, either of you, um, like a short comment that is burning that you'd like to share with us before we move on. Because there's a lot that's been shared here and a lot of potential responses and continuations. But before we move on to the audience questions, anything you're just really eager to share? I've talked too much already. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, you know, as a food for thought for the uh, ongoing conversation we're going to have over the next, uh, you know, rest of 45 minutes is really also to, you know, Emily pointed it out already by referring to some of these thought traditions and communities that uh, framed and thought about technology in very different ways. And I think for us, it is also very helpful in going back um, to the roots of AI, right? And to remember that there were two um, paths, a crossroad basically, between an approach that was explored at the Dartmouth workshop in the 1950s, which was about creating a machine that could simulate intelligent behavior, right? It's an agent-based model of technology. And then we have the Macy's conferences of cybernetics, which were more looking at the patterns and processes that integrated technology into living complex systems. And for us in this conversation, that distinction can be very helpful in understanding what kinds of pathways to research with and about technology we should consider in order to open up more humane futures. Um, and uh, yeah, I look forward to hearing more responses also from both Emily and Peter about that. But I believe that it is really time to come back with a system oriented approach to enable that kind of collective digital activism and agency that Peter is um, addressing here. Andre, thanks. Um, with the potential of overly sympathize, simplifying what you just said, it was really helpful for me to hear. We've got this one early on, this one view of like, we're gonna make AI like a human or this other possibility, we're gonna integrate AI into the ways that we are as humans. And we have a question, Emily, I see that you've unmuted yourself, but if you're okay, I'd like to tie this into a question from the audience. We have a question that I think maybe builds on that too a bit in the way that we might as humans understand our interaction with AI. Um, and this comes from Philippe, who um, is deeply interested in this topic. He's um, an alumni and a team member um, at the East-West Center, joining us, I believe, today from Tahiti. And he asks, um, he notes that in a recent article published on, on Wired, Kate Darling suggests that we shouldn't think of machines or robots and AI systems as comparable to humans, but more to animals. And and calling to us to review our relationship with them, animals or AI. Do you think that before talking about elements of ethics to have a more humane AI, we should first define to what level of interaction we want to engage with AI and therefore find ways to collaborate more than focusing on questions of being replaced or outpaced? I will open that to whoever wants to respond, Peter. <laughs> I think one part of the, the beginning of the response kind of ties in with what Andre was saying, and that's that there was from the outset this idea of modeling human intelligence in a computational system and getting computational systems, algorithmic systems, to be able to engage the world like a human being does. And the unit of analysis has always been the individual human. And I think if we look seriously at how AI is now being developed, intelligent technology. I'd like to call it intelligent technology because it makes clear, at least from my perspective, we're talking about a relational system. So we could talk about agency and agencies, but I don't think we can properly talk about agents yet. 
And we're not yet in a position of talking about artificial intelligence as being conscious. Or if we do, we need a, need a much different understanding of the concept of consciousness to do that. And in some of the work that I've been doing on consciousness studies, I mean, I would make the argument that indeed, these AI agencies are conscious. They're conscious maybe in the way that we are in dream states. They may be conscious in the way we are, you know, in maybe a lucid dream in some cases, but they don't have anything like the agency that we human beings have. They're not freely able to change their programming in that way. They can't change their values. The values are programmed in and human beings are programmed in. So I think when we're talking about the relationship that we have with intelligent technology, what it really comes down to is what kinds of relationship do we wanna have with one another and with the world? Because intelligent technology is mediating that relationship. It's the medium within which we're engaging one another and our environments. So if our relations with one another are competitive, control-oriented, convenience-oriented, if we're just looking for the easiest route to getting what we want as soon as we can in whatever way we want, karmically, that plays out in a really negative fashion because that's a loop. I mean, to get better at getting what you want, you have to get better at wanting. To get better at wanting, though, means you have to constantly experience yourself as being in a state of want or lack. Therefore, you ultimately can never want what you get. It's that ramping up of dissatisfaction. And we're sort of, we're sort of grandfathered into that from the attention economy 1.0. But now every little clue about what we fear, desire, love, hate, that's present in social media posts and purchasing behavior and search behavior is being fed back to us to reinforce precisely that. So I think we're talking about really revolutionizing our conception of human nature before we can really talk about the nature of artificial intelligence as a partner. And I think, yes, we can make the claim that intelligent technology can partner with humanity. That's already being done. That's the syntheses I'm talking about. It's algorithmic systems making use of human intelligence that's carried with the data that's uh, carried into this digital infrastructure by our attention. We are already synthesizing new forms of agency. What we need to do is take responsibility for that. Emily, Andrea, I'd love to hear any thought. We'd love to hear any thoughts or responses to either what Peter shared or the original question. I'd add um, a small note. Um, it, it's interesting even in the way that the question is framed, um, the presumption of separation of humans from animals and a consideration um, that challenges the fallacy of singularity in cultures and ethics and um, in relationship in structures and systems. Um, plenty of cultures will say we are animals we are nature. We are part of. We are part of that. A lot of um, cultures um, in Africa and Asia and around the world um, look at AI and look at machine learning as an extension of, uh, that everything is sacred and everything that manifests has a sacred relationship and may be embodied. Uh, so while there might be a dominant discourse that pushes a singularity and anthropocentric understanding, um, there is in fact, and has been a through line of multiple discourses, multiple narratives of culture and relationship that connect to technology, to ecology, to community. Um, and it, some of that even as, as um, Andre brought up in the cybernetics, um, Roy Rappaport wrote about the cybernetics of the holy and ritual sanctity in cybernetics. Lovelock, James Lovelock and Lingard Margulis, who formed the Gaia theory and Gaia hypothesis, they themselves also explored um, in, in a way God and the computer and the relationship of um, breaking away from mechanistic universe and replaceable parts that you see with Dawkins and gene, gene theory um, and move it into more of um, a dynamic mutual <laughs> um, interface that we create each other as as we come into contact with each other and so the message that peter is really bringing forth that i see is that when you open 
the discourse when you and 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 Andre as well of who's at the table, who's forming the table, whose voices are there. The more voices that come to the table as we evolve and face the reality of our um, AI futures, perhaps the healthier, more reflective, and more collaborative it will be for our well-being, um, our social ecological well-being. Um, and we do have the models in nature of how to live in a healthy way, unity through diversity, and that diversity makes us whole. Maybe building then on that um, response, Emily, is one more question, then I'll turn it back over to the panelists to ask each other. Um, I, I think because of um, the robust conversation, it might just end up being one or two more questions. But I'll go to this um, second question from our um, participants, the folks listening in, um, really building quite well off of what you just said. I think, Emily, um, noting that you are all the experts and I'm uh, just learning about all this with your help. Um, the participant says that um, AI and other technologies are produced from um, a set of values and a cultural environment that influences their designs and interactions with humans it's as, every, as we've been talking about um, this afternoon. Um, but even more so, the interactions we have with them are defined um, according to specific visions of the world, economic, politically, et cetera and the social interactions as you've all stated. So the question, you know, maybe you've answered this in some of your um, comments already, but it's worth asking again, for a more inclusive, and I would say a more humane AI, how do we define a set of principles that would integrate a broader vision of the world and broader values? In fact, are there universal values in order to avoid AI becoming um, something that just produces one vision of the world? In fact, that's the whole topic of the panel. So maybe, um, yeah. Well, I'll just, I'll just say, Here. I very much enjoy a distinction that's made by a French philosopher, Jean-Luc Nancy, between the common and the shared. And very often we wanna to rush to the kind of universal values, the common values, so-called of humanity. And for Nancy, he would say that, you know, this discourse about the common always has a coercive edge to it because the common is supposed to be something that's the same in everybody. But in fact, there is no sameness. You know, we do have different understandings of privacy. We have different understandings of something as elemental as familial love. So if we're as divided on things as basic as friendship, love, privacy, and so on, then I don't think that we have the basis for a universal common set of values, but we do have a possibility of shared values. So for a Nancy, uh, shared value is a value in which everybody has a contributory stake. So it's like in economics terms, a share, you have a share in a company, you're part owner and you have a stake in how it proceeds and you benefit from it and you can influence its movement and direction. But a share is also a process that we engage in a process of sharing. And when you share a dance or you share a meal, you don't both do the same things. You know, here in Hawaii, we have lots of potluck. And if everybody brings rice to the potluck, it's a lousy potluck. If everybody brings desserts to the potluck, some people might think that's a good potluck. I would not think it's a good potluck. I think what you want is you have some fish, you have some vegetables, you have some meat, you have some broiled stuff, you have some grilled stuff. You know, everybody contributes something different. If they come from different cuisines, even better yet. You know, you got some spicy stuff, you have savory stuff. So I think it's that vision that Emily was talking about of diversity of, Taking, taking our guidance from the systems that have persisted, that everything in the world around us, the cosmos that we are a part of, is a record of differentiations from big bang on of everything that has mattered enough to be able to continue, all right? It doesn't mean it's good. It just means it's mattered enough. There's enough significance and meaning there for it to work. And we can look and see how ecological systems are working. They are sustainable, they are resilient, they're responsive, they're creative. We could try modeling our political systems, our economic systems on that, rather than on the win-loss competitive dynamic. I mean, anybody who's done anything new reading in evolutionary theory, theory knows competition takes place within species, generally speaking, not among species, except you get invasive species that come into a system and disrupt it from outside. Within an ecosystem, 
species collaborate. They scope out their different niches and they work together in a way that's like the way family members work, but you don't have to talk about it or the way musicians work when you're improvising together. It's not like you need a guide or a set of principles to do that. What you need is sensitivity and the sensibility to respond as needed to differ as you need to, to get buy-in in the environment that we're a part of. So I describe this as a difference between a power focus and a strength focus. Power allows us to determine how things turn out. Strength is what it takes to be able to engage in any situation whatsoever, to keep everybody who's involved, involved and playing so that the, this infinite game that we're involved in, the quality of the play gets better. Power is always a finite game. Someone wins, somebody loses. We need to move away from power games to the finite power games, to infinite games of strength. Beautiful, Peter, thank you. Andre, Emily, Andre, I see you've muted yourself, please. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, we, uh, this is a great um, prompt. I think it ties very nicely also back into, uh, you know, the previous questions about how we should treat the AI. I think what we need to do also is um, to demystify artificial intelligence because what happens a lot of times currently is that we conflate the notion of AI with the notion of an agent that is usually like a robot that we have in our mind, maybe a cyborg. And in that space only, it becomes actually possible um, to discuss how we should treat the AI. Should we treat it as another human, as a superior being, as an animal? But uh, you know, we also need to recognize that um, the idea that we are sort of at the cusp of meeting a thinking machine is nothing new. It's a narrative that has circulated in human cultures around the world for centuries. If you look at Greek mythologies or novels and plays from the Industrial Revolution, like Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, or even you know the sci-fi movies in, in the last decades, um, such as Michael Crichton's West World, we see a lot of portraits of intelligent technology as this other that is kind of causing um, you know, kind of a cybernetic apocalypse uh, where machine agents rise against humanity. But if we come back again at this distinction between tools and technologies that Peter has outlined in the beginning, it becomes also apparent that in order to have a much more diverse and inclusive engagement with AI as a technology, we need to recognize that uh, you know, technology is a system that amplifies our relationship as Peter has mentioned it. So it is rather also about not controlling technology, but finding ways how to creatively engage with it in different ways where technology has its own place, but other forms of intelligence are also existing that have their own place. And in that kind of diverse ecosystem of different intelligences, there is sort of an ambient, I don't know, rhythm pattern emerging based on which we can actually inform a more ethical behavior. But that will not happen if we kind of, be, you know, stay in our first order cybernetics view, so to say, you know, the idea that we could be outside of the system and control it. But actually we need to recognize that we are all embedded in this resonant space. And so technology is just sort of another player in that. And um, there we come into a space where it's much more about tapping into the creativity and inventiveness of human intelligence and remembering what aspects of human intelligence are unique that cannot be replicated by machine intelligence and the other way around as well. But this is, I think, very important to recognize that um, uh, AI is not an agent per se, but we make it that way. And that's also how we cause these risks and perils actually to emerge. They're kind of kind of riffing on that. I think that we could do worse than to think in what sometimes referred to as nativist or animist terms, where say in Shinto, a boulder has spirit, energy, whatever you want to call it. There's something there that's a presence that changes relational dynamics, but it's not an agent. And it's not identifiable with the rock as rock. It's the boulder in connection and relation with everything around it. And I think artificial agencies operate much like these Shinto kami, 
they're ambient within an environment. They're, they're a focus of things going on in an environment. They can help certain kinds of things happen if you have the appropriate relationship with them. You can elicit help from them. And I think that that's a way of thinking about intelligent technology. We can elicit help from it, but it all depends on being able to recognize that and not confusing it with a system that you develop a individual to individual relationship with, because it doesn't operate that way. And so I think that you're right that we need a, a transformation to occur at a very basic level of how we're understanding technology and to not confuse intelligent technology with robots among us. I mean, walk into a factory floor, those are robots. That's not intelligent technology. It's part of it, the big scheme of things, but these are just tools, they're artifacts. You can walk around them, you can disable them. You can't disable the technology. Emily, sorry, were you going to say something? Um, just, I, I would love for Peter to suss out a little bit more some of the elements that he drew out in his book that, that build on what you both are speaking about right now um, through a Buddhist perspective of no self and no separation. Um, you spoke about, and, and also consideration of right thought, right speech, right action, right relationship, right ecology, how that translates to a perception and understanding of AI or extended intelligence or ambient intelligence. Um, you, you wrote a bit about our what we're deciding to do in our engagement with AI is then what we are creating. And so from a Buddhist line of thought, could you speak a little bit about um, where we have opportunities for course correction? And um, what, is, what is the mirror and what is the, <laughs> the, the mirroring of who we are and who we decide to be? Um, because your core question in the book really is who do we need to be at this point? Um, and I'd love, I'd love to hear you speak about that a bit more, Peter. If I could add a question onto that too, or like, uh, because Andre, Emily, and Peter, of course, are deeply embedded in thinking about this and thinking about how it um, not only connects to your your scholarship, but your your also your work in the world. Um, not that those are different, but you know how you're interacting with people, what you're looking at with the communities that you're working on, and then 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 there are people like me who are you know pretty well um, educated, trying to follow, trying to understand. And, um, you know, meanwhile, feel very caught up in like this system as we all are and are sort of unaware perhaps that we even have a choice. Um, and in some ways this seems inevitable that this technology will, um, that this is gonna outpace us in some way. So how do, connecting that question to Emily, I'd love to hear Peter's response on that. Yeah, I think that um, the saturation of our lives with algorithmic systems is happening at a pace and with a subtlety that is often missed because we're just simply unaware of the technical dimensions of it. So with something like new cars, my truck is 21 years old and it doesn't have any smart systems on it at all, it doesn't even have electric windows. But new cars are recording everything that's going on. It's when your car doors open and where they open from GPS reading. It's when the lights go on. It's whether you had passengers in the car, how many passengers when, the addresses that you're visiting. And all of that can be read out from things like the information system in the car, from the thing that's monitoring gas use in the car, that all these systems are interconnected. And if you can hack into any one of them, then you can get all the information in it. So you can, from somebody's automobile, derive a kind of life history of that person and their activities. Same thing with a, a smartphone, obviously. But we don't think about, you know, we worry about people getting our smartphone and what we do with it, but not with the automobile. So it's becoming so thoroughly embedded with this internet of things that it's becoming 
ubiquitous, it's ambient. The intelligence is ambient. It's all around us, we're suffused by it. Uh, it's in our clothes at times, it's in shoes that you wear. And so on the one hand, that's wonderful. It keeps us from having to kind of interface with it actively. On the other hand, it makes it really hard to be responsible for what's done with all of that data that's being produced. So I think part of getting critical leverage is first getting communities that are aware that this is going on and why it matters. And I think that I would suggest anybody who's interested in what some of the downsides of algorithmic uses in say public administration um, would look at books like um, Weapons of Math Destruction, not Mass Destruction, um, where basically what a highly trained computational scientist is looking at what happens when algorithms don't take into account real world relational dynamics and start to do harm, not because they were designed to do it. This is just, it's a design flaw because of the way the data is being generated and what's being, what's being modeled into the system in terms of its objectives. And so I think that what we wanna do is say, who do I need to be present as in order to become aware of these things and to take responsibility for how my data is being used? And we can do that. I mean, the European Union has a general data protection plan that every website, you visit the website, a corporate website, and you're prompted, how do you want your data used? You can go through the list and take the time to do that. Now, this, the problem is, is lots of people won't take the time. They just click and go, I don't care, it doesn't matter to me. And I think what we wanna do is to say how it matters. And if you took a book like Weapons of Math Destruction, you took some of those stories in it and turned them into feature films. You turn them into you know, great rap tunes where somebody's really talking about how this stuff operates and bring it to a general public in a way that a general public can get interested and engaged, then I think we have a chance. But if it's people like me talking philosophy or I'm talking Buddhism and, and somebody's a Muslim or a Christian or just totally a religious, they, they tune out. Why would they? But if it's a good story, we need better narratives, a narrative of hope, a narrative of strength in which we as human beings can reconfigure our future because we can always change our configurations of values, our intentions and the actions that put them into, into place in the world. That is our, our right. That is our, our capacity. Nobody could take that away from us unless they take away our attention. They take away our attention, we, we are totally lost. So I would say what we need is attention training. And I would recommend anybody who has not started doing basic attention training and meditation to start doing it. Because it's the one way that you realize you do not at present, unless you've been a meditator for a while, you do not have any control over your own thoughts. You don't have any control over your emotions. You don't have any control over what you're doing most of the day. You're on automatic. And you realize it when you try to pay attention to something as simple as your breathing. Breathe in, breathe out 10 times without doing anything else. You get to three and then you're thinking about lunch or dinner or what have you. It's really hard. And so as attention moves around and can't be stabilized, it's a lot easier to distract and attract. And what we want is to be able to, to use our attention for our purposes for the purposes of our family members, for the purposes of our friends, to be able to have what it takes in terms of those commitments and the clarity about how to deploy that, you need some real clarity within your consciousness. So I think that, yes, it's a revolutionary thing. We need a consciousness revolution in addition to all the other things we need politically, economically, and so on. We really need a consciousness revolution to get people to care enough to want to participate in the resistance to the misuses of good, otherwise good tools, but also in the deployment of systems that have these ironic or, or conflicting values built into them. If I may add uh, to that comment, Peter, I, you know, I, I also think that uh, besides um, the dimension of attention and consciousness, I think. Um, part of you know, the, the, the root cause of some of the perils that we're talking about here is also coming from a lack of imagination, what our desired futures could and should be. And so we're also tapping here into the dimension of creativity. And as somebody coming from an art background, this is something very important to me, is we need to also recognize that the current technologies that we are getting in touch with 
we are kind of encountering them mainly uh, from the position and role of a user or consumer. And there are less and less spaces where we actually have an opportunity to engage with these technologies as a creator. And so, um, and if we are creators, we are mainly creators as part of the, uh, you know, tech entrepreneurship economy. But uh, the, the spaces of critical artistic engagement with technologies like AI is getting smaller and smaller. And I feel like this is a very important perspective to explore further also in terms of what kind of role academic institutions can play besides offering a discourse and a different kind of narrative around thinking about these technologies. It's about also how do we foster that technical literacy, that futures literacy, to put the technology back into the hands of the communities that are going to be impacted by them and allow them to kind of figure out how they want to use and govern them in their own terms. Um, yeah, so here we go back again, you, you know, like it's this interesting interplay between a tool and the technology actually. We need to think about both sides of it in order to enhance the humane impact of both. I think we have time um, for another question and a set of responses. And I will open it up to anyone on the panel to ask anyone else uh, a question at this point. I would actually value if someone from the audience would push something our way. I know that sometimes people are hesitant to, uh, to intervene or ask a question that they think, oh, it's gonna be off track or I really have nothing. You, you have something to contribute. And sometimes the, the questions that come out of left field are the ones that, you know, they're the greatest questions. So if you have something burning, go ahead and write it in. It's really hard in a Zoom environment because, especially in a webinar, we don't see anybody. <laughs> so it's, it's a little bit of a vacuum. There is another question that I can put out um, from the audience that I can put out to the panelists. Uh, but I would encourage, as Peter's just done, re-encourage anyone to, um, uh, to share any questions you might have. So um, actually one's just come in, so I'll go to that. Could you um, elaborate a bit on the freedom of attention is freedom of intention. Yeah, so connects with issues of freedom in general. And those of us who are raised in an American environment have been taught from birth that freedom is choice. And I think choice is a kind of freedom and a life without choice is a pretty sad life. But to identify freedom just for choosing, I think is really deficient. Uh, there's the freedom that comes with commitment, engaging in a sustained practice. The freedom that comes from deciding, I'm gonna be a great athlete. I'm gonna train every day for multiple hours a day. I'm gonna go through the pain of it. I'm gonna to get to the point where my body can do anything the sport requires of me at a, at a superlative level. That's freedom. And maybe along the way, there's a lot of disciplining and there's a lot of hard work and there's a lot of disappointment, but that's an expression of a kind of freedom that has nothing to do with making choices. And similarly, I think that for most of us, we tend to think that we do what we want to do, that we, we have our values, we have our interests and we act on them. And then I, I would ask my sons when they were teenagers and when they give the argument, which American kids often do, you're infringing on my freedom. You're keeping me from being able to do what I want. And I asked them the question, where did your wants come from? What do you mean? Where did your desire to do this come from? Did it come from your bedroom when you were sitting in your room by yourself? No, it came through your interactions with others. Where did the thought come from that you wanna do this? And so unless we have freedom of attention, being able to pay to different dimensions of ourself, to be able to dig into the process of the arising of thoughts, the arising of feelings and emotions and see where they come from, how they're relationally constituted. Thoughts don't come from nowhere. They come out of a, a relational process dynamically have been playing out. And once you get good at paying attention to that, you could start to see where this stuff comes from. The beauty of it is it allows you a, a different kind of freedom. It's a freedom of your own intentionality, being able to say, you know what? It's my own values that are the problem. It's not the other person. It's not the system, it's me. 
I haven't been engaging in this appropriately because I have had a conflict among my values. I've had contrary actions. And that's why I'm having this event, this trouble, this suffering, whatever it may be. So I think that without that freedom of attention, we can't actually see the process moment by moment by moment of, in Buddhism, it would be called our karma playing out. We can't observe it. But once you start observing it, then it's like, wow, now I'm really responsible for it. I can't blame this on anybody else. I have to, to take it by the reins and do what I can do with it. And when you're in a position like that, you can start to see others who are caught by their thinking, caught by their emotions, then you can't help but feel compassion. You know, so it's that awareness of how it works in yourself that gets you to recognize it happening in somebody else and to realize they're no more in charge of yelling at you than you were of negatively responding to what they were doing. It was just all automatic stuff playing out. And to get to the point that you can freely start to change that dynamic requires at least one and ideally both or as many people as involved to collectively be there in a shared moment and say, you know what? We can drop all this pretense. We don't have to do it this way. We can sit in silence for a while and start to figure out how do we galvanize in this moment a shared way forward that we can all participate in. As different as we are, where our differences are not ignored, are they not tolerated, they actually become the basis of mutual contribution to the shared endeavor. So that's where we want to end up. I don't think we can get there without the quality of attention and intentionality that comes with understanding the dynamics of consciousness and the way it plays out. Thank you. There's another question from the audience um, that I can share with the panel if, um, if you're okay with that. Um, this is related to the comment on storytelling and narrative and um, also the comparison of development of AI with what's happening in climate change. And um, this person says, we write the story as we live it. So we need to, I think as Andre has said, we need to have um, creativity of imagination um, and have stories of hope and stories of despair at the same time to make make sure that we have a sort of full set um, a narrative of the future. It's more a comment, but also um, a comment that perhaps has a question embedded for your response responses. I wouldn't mind starting just a little response and seeing what, what that sparks with others. Um, well, it's a beautiful comment and uh, our brains are wired for story throughout cultures, throughout history, throughout time. Story is where we anchor our relationships. Um, it may be where we find momentary or no meaning. And if we step back from this larger picture of, of an acceleration of change, and transformation on our planet, the climate change, ecological crises, um, state, um, basically governments um, being challenged to continue functioning in international government as well. Um, in that we're asking for where are the elements that we can engage in a process of in, in guiding where we where this goes, who will we be? And story and narrative and song and cultures coming together help us see ourselves with each other. Um, the more we find ways to share our climate stories, the way people have adapted, how there's been um, loss um, and echo, ecological toxicity, trauma in great disasters, in violence and complex emergencies, and how people have come out of that, and what shared values of appreciation start to form through that. I believe that there's a pivotal point within that shared storytelling that helps us say, this is what we, this is the vision and the pathway out of suffering. These are the causes of suffering. And 
in order to charge a movement that will have to have multiple threads and points that are integral to all of our being on, on, on the planet, um, we need something that catalyzes change from within. And the change from within is the starting point in our relationships with each other. And story can be that point where we sit with it, we embed it, we tell it, and that is the catalyst for our own engagement and action and the catalyst for many others. So it's a very, very powerful space. Thank you for the comment. There's also a, a comment question in the chat function there where Patricia has noted that uh, she agrees with the um, creativity and imagination dimension of things and recognizes that we've been conditioned to consume creative products as opposed to producing them ourselves. I think it's entirely true. It is harder to create a work of art, to play a song, come up with a new tune, than it is just to click on Spotify and download a hundred different things you know, from around the world in an instant and then spend the rest of your day listening to it. Uh, it is more difficult, but then there are rewards. And I think with the education dimension, part of what I would envision is starting very young with kids and the kind of attention training that they can do, which is not what an adult meditator would do or something, but basic attention training connected especially with creative processes, you know, doing music, doing art, growing plants, you know, cleaning the school. I mean, doing things that uh, can lead to this loop of maybe it's not very much fun to begin with, but you get a sense of satisfaction. And with something that's creative, like growing things, you can really see that you have an effect, that your actions and how much you pay attention to the plants actually impact other living things. And that's a lesson that gets learned. And this can happen in an urban school as well as in, in a rural environment. So I think that we could start with that and get children used to the idea that they can in fact be producers of things and not just consumers. It's really, really crucial. Yes, and in addition to that, I, I also think, you know, it's a, important to recognize that recently there is this, uh, you know, push towards STEM education, right? In um, early childhood education, schools in general, and while um, this is certainly helpful, it also does not really solve the problem of creativity to my personal opinion. I think um, what really needs to happen is really a reconsideration about, similar to what Emily mentioned and what was in the comment in the audience is, what are the tools, methods, mediums that really kind of speak to the unique facets of human intelligence, the emotional, intuitive, embodied, wisdom that we all carry and that we are all capable of uh, executing and expressing, right? And once we kind of get to that space, we can also then figure out how we can use these emergent tools like AI um, to actually enhance or um, find new ways of relating to that particular knowledge and intelligence. So in here, we kind of find a way to kind of come full circle in not having technology as the other at the outside that is taking over us. And now we need to kind of ethically figure out how we can govern it. But we actually see it as Emily mentioned also earlier as an extension to our selves, our communities that can be used creatively and in harmony. And that is the big challenge, I guess, for the next iteration of um, you know, the educational paradigm that uh, we are here together exploring. Emily, Andre, Peter, it's been such a pleasure to host you um, this afternoon here in Honolulu uh, on this panel. And to, I, I really am appreciative of how we've um, come to the point at the end of our talk story where we're talking about incredibly human things, um, gardening and sitting and music and, um, and art. And I found that, um, I guess, quite surprising and also really um, hopeful uh, in on a topic that I often find um, quite confusing. And um, when I do see glimmers of understanding, I find it a little bit scary. So I'm really quite appreciative of the fact that we ended at this very hopeful spot. And 
appreciate, again, appreciate the time the three of you have taken um, to share the accumulation of your interest and um, expertise and your, your ongoing questions around this really important topic of um, humane artificial intelligence and what is it, what kind of world do we want to be a part of and how do we want to interact with one another and with the um, technologies that are a part of our lives. So really, again, really appreciate that. And I feel, I know that this is a part of an ongoing discussion. I hope that we can host you again here in the leadership program, both virtually and uh, in live engagements uh, in the future. And uh, yeah, just deeply appreciative. I also want to thank the people behind the scenes um, on the team here at the East West Center, Nathan, Daryl, and Cheryl, uh, Keely and Lori, who have made this work seamlessly, have allowed it to be broadcast um, to additional audiences on Facebook and YouTube. Um, and also to all of you who are joining us on any of these platforms, thanks for taking time. We know you have lots of things calling your attention and many things you could be doing with your time and the fact that you've spent it here with us this evening or this morning um, or this afternoon uh, means a lot. Please, um, Look for information from the East West Center, from um, the work that Peter and his team does, the work that the leadership program team does. We host a number of conversations like this and always um, enjoy hosting you um, for these conversations too. Thanks for everyone's wonderful questions. And again, Peter, Emily, Andre, thank you very much. Thank you. Wonderful.